Hello, this is Josiah Winslow recording for his programming and Java course at MATC for instructor Mark Cribb. Another day, another six programming challenges from the textbook. Let's get right to them, shall we? So the testing suite hasn't changed at all since last time, so I won't go over it at all. Let's move right on to Chapter 7, Challenge 8, which is Gradebook. Now, we've had a bunch of Gradebook-related assignments in the past, uh, and test score-related assignments in the past, but this one requires us to store the names alongside each of uh, the scores. So each name will have associated with it four scores, which we will have to average and then return the letter grade for. And by the way, just for kicks, I also uh, made the modification that is given in the next challenge in uh, Chapter 7, Ch Chapter 7, Challenge 9. Modify the gradebook application so that it drops each student's lowest score when determining the test score averages and letter grades. Uh, I ended up implementing both methods. So first, let's go over the gradebook class. Now, uh, it's pretty simple. It has a string list of names, and it has a list of lists of devils called scores. Plus it has these constants that uh, have to do with, that have to do with scores. So the constructor uh, gives new array lists to uh, both of these variables, and I have a function called get name and get scores uh, where I get the names and scores and there's also a uh, get student count that returns the size of uh, one of these uh, array lists now uh, they're both the same size if everything goes well so this gives us the number of students then there's an add name method to uh, add a name to the names lists and an empty array list into the scores list and then it returns the index of that name into uh, the array lists to help with uh, you know figuring out which one corresponds to uh, the student now I would use some sort of key value pair or like a map if I were uh, doing this my way but this chapter is about arrays and array lists, so I went with parallel lists. Then I have an add score method, which adds a score to uh, the student index into the scores list. I have a validator for the score, which checks if it's in a certain bound. I have a function for turning a score into a letter grade, which is uh, the same as one of my previous assignments. And I also have a pretty standard average method that also takes in a boolean called exclude lowest, which if true, it uh, subtracts the minimum score in the list from the uh, sum, and uh, it subtracts one from the score's length before dividing it. And here I overload it with uh, one argument that is just the student index which passes false for the other argument by default so that's uh pretty simple here we make a new grade book and for each student uh it asks for the name then we add the name to the list and then it asks for each of their four scores And then for each of them, it prints their name, the average as a letter grade, and the average without the minimum as a letter grade. So let's go ahead and test that out. So let's say Amanda is a perfect student. She always gets A pluses. And let's say Brent is perfect except for one test that he didn't take. Cindy is 
pretty consistently B range. But she had one bad score that was like a low C. So her average should be somewhere in between a C and a B. And Drake has averages that are consistently like 67, uh, 73, 69, 59, somewhere around there. And finally, Evelyn. Uh, let's just have it be all over the place. And here we go. The perfect student has a perfect average and a perfect average without min. Brent, uh, that one test that he missed gave him a C, but if we exclude that, then it's an A. Cindy uh, was a B-level student, so she gets a B. Drake has scores that are consistently around 67, so he gets a D. And Evelyn, well, whatever this is, uh, this all checks out. So let's move on to the next challenge, uh, which has to do with file I.O., population data. So there is a website, which is right here, where we can download a file called uspopulation.txt, and we have to read its numbers, calculate uh, the changes in population between all the years, and then we have to find the average, max, and min of that list of changes in population. So here I have the string that is the path on my computer where I've stored it. Uh, I chose this to be an absolute path because why not? And here I have a list which I populate with all the integers from the file and the read numbers from file uh, method basically populates a integer list with the next int that it finds using a scanner in the file until it can't find any. And if there's an I.O. exception, then it couldn't find the file, and then we return. So now that we have that list, we calculate the deltas of the list, and delta is a fancy word for change. So here we are. And uh, we loop through all of the list except for one element, and then we subtract uh, the next one from the current one, and then add that to a list called deltas. And we return it, and then we can get up here. I decided to calculate the average, min, and max all through one pass in the list, uh, because why not? I certainly think it's a, a good way to do it. So we uh, instantiate, this is uh, the sum that we're using for the average, and in the end we're going to divide it by the size of the list. And these are uh, values that have to do with the min and max, uh, both the val and the index. And I really don't have to initialize those there because I do it in the first pass of the loop, but NetBeans yells at me if I don't, so here they are. So I go through. I take uh, the current number, add that to the sum, and if it's the first uh, pass through, then the min and max val and min and max index are both set to the first val uh, and zero. Otherwise, I update them if the current val is less than the min or greater than the max. Then I divide to get the average. And then, uh, here I'm multiplying by a thousand because it's asking about, uh, thousands of people. The, the format of the file is population in thousands. So, I am taking the average annual change, which is that many thousand people. The year with the largest increase is I take the max index and add it to 1951, 
which 1950 is the first year that the file has population data for, so 1951 is the first year that can have a population change. And the year with the smallest increase, same story. And if we run it, <clears throat> then we get exactly what we expect. And uh, I ran this again with a uh, Python program, and I'm getting the same results as that, so that seems to check out, unless I coded it wrong both times. Now, I'm gonna wait to talk about this, mostly because of the sheer number of imports, and the sheer amount of work that I had to do on it. Well, not had to, chose to. But anyways, let's move on for now to chapter 9, which is all about text processing and wrapper classes. Now, uh, I actually go over two different ways to do Chapter 9 Challenge 1 and Chapter 9 Challenge 9, right there in the top right corner. Uh, you don't have to watch that whole video if you don't want to, but I think it's pretty interesting. And it also talks about what even a char is in Java and how they correspond to Unicode code points which are basically the closest objective thing you can get to a character. So the backward string is uh, pretty standard. So we ask for input and pass it to a reverse string function, and the reverse string function takes a string builder and loops through the input string backwards, and it keeps uh, appending s.char at i. So it's appending the chars backwards and then it returns that as a string. Now, this is good. This is all, f th th this is fine. But there is another way to do this, and uh, I'm just going to go over it quickly. Your book doesn't tell you about this, but your IDE does, so. Well, I actually, first I should test this out just to see if it works. And if I input gravity, hey, look at that. Get a varg. Amazing. Now there's another way you can do this, and uh, it uses an inbuilt function of the string builder. So what I can do is I can do sb, that's my string builder object, dot append s. And then I can do sb dot reverse so this is a built-in function and it reverses the characters in the string builder but not only that it is sensitive to unicode code points too because like a char in java is a 16-bit integer unsigned integer and it corresponds to a utf-16 code point which basically you can use either one or two of them to represent a single Unicode code point. And this keeps Unicode code points intact. So if you were to give it, say, an emoji, uh, it wouldn't be thrown out of whack by reversing its code units. Now, I can't actually do that in NetBeans. But... Wrong challenge. Wow. If for some reason I can't input emojis into uh, NetBeans right here without the program not running at all, it's really weird. But this does work with regular text. And if we were to go into this and give it an emoji, this, by the way, is the same thing as I have uh, written in the other one. L M F A O. Face uh, with tears of joy. Who did this? And then I go down here. So this emoji uh, stays intact. And if I were to do this. With the other method, where I loop through the string backwards and I keep appending the chars, it will take this 
which uh, uses two different chars to represent it, it would break it up and it would make it look like that. What are those? Those are reversed code units that do not make sense together now. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and let's move on to challenge nine. Now, there is uh, another way to do this that involves a function called character.isDigit and character.getNumericValue. But what I decided to do is uh, when I'm looping through the string, I take the character at uh, the current value and then I subtract it from the character zero. Now, you might think, hold on, this doesn't make sense. Uh, you're subtracting characters. Well, characters, if you recall, chars are 16-bit unsigned integers. No, really, they are 16-bit unsigned integers. Java considers uh, chars an integral data type. And your book will tell you this if you go into chapter 2. It has a whole section on uh, the char data type. And it even tells you that you can use integers to store into chars. And I found out after experimenting that you can do math to them. So what it does is uh, it takes the code unit value of that char and does arithmetic to that. So when I'm taking this digit, I'm subtracting it from the value for zero, which is uh, 48. And then this gives me from zero to nine if uh, the character was in that range anyway, which here we can assume that they are uh, all digits. But, you know, usually you'd check. So yeah, chars are integers in disguise. So let's go ahead and run this. And look at that. 2 plus 5 is 7, plus 1 is 8, plus 4 is 12. That checks out. Now, the Morse code converter, chapter 9, challenge 16, I'm pretty excited about because uh, I did something that I think is unique. And it also is uh, the lowest space complexity that I can think of for storing all of these mappings of characters to Morse code sequences. <clears throat> so the main function is pretty simple. Uh, it asks you to enter a string, and for every char, uh, it appends the Morse code representation of that into a string builder, and then delimits them with spaces, and then prints that out. Now the char to Morse function, this is where the magic happens. Now, if uh, the character is a space, I just have it returning a regular old space. And, uh, I don't have time to explain this here because I promised myself I would make this short. Uh, shorter than usual, anyways. But, uh, I did explain this in class, or... I'm, I'm actually recording this, uh, on Saturday night. So, well, the morning of Saturday, so... I will have explained this in class three days from now. Time is a weird thing. But anyways, needless to say, uh, what was my point? Oh yeah, yeah. So, I have engineered this string such that if we find the index of that character in the string, and then convert that to binary, and then uh, take everything but the first character of that string, then the binary number that we get is the Morse code representation of that letter, but with the dots as zeros and the dashes as ones. So, for now you don't need to know 
what this even means. Uh, if you look up Morse code binary tree or something like that, then you'll be able to see what I mean. But this is sort of like a more compact representation of that than it would be for me to make a whole binary tree class and populate it with all of these letters. Now, I could actually do this technique for every single character uh, that is a sequence of dots and dashes, but then we, I would have to add a whole bunch of uh, stuff to the end of the string, which, because uh, not as many characters are assigned to longer sequences of dots and dashes, it would mostly be empty space that I keep adding to the string. So, at a certain point, I decided it would uh, be a lot more storage space than it's worth, and a lot, uh, a lot less clear about what this whole thing does. So, for the others, I decided to do other things. So, that was all for the letters. Right here. For the numbers, I figured out that if you take this special string and index into it at certain points, uh, you will get the representations of all the numbers. For example, this right here is the Morse code for 0. This is the Morse code for 1. This is the Morse code for 2. This is the Morse code for 3. And so on and so forth. All throughout the string. So I do that for the numbers, and for the rest of uh, the punctuation, I use a switch statement. Because I couldn't see uh, any way to work these into a good pattern. Now this is probably what was intended, and uh, in fact, if we did it right, and uh, handled the dot in a special way maybe, I could have done a whole bunch of string replaces. But in the end, I went with uh, all that. And let's see how it works. And voila! Morse code in Morse code. And let's uh, also do something a little more complicated. Whoa! This is cool. Uh, this took 500 hours. There we go. And this all checks out. So finally, uh, let us get to the trivia game. Now, Mr. Crib, I would said to you in one class period that... There was a Spongebob game for PC called Battle for Bikini Bottom, which, if you've ever heard of it, is distinct from the console and Game Boy Advance versions. It's like an entirely different thing. And it has as part of it uh, this trivia game where you answer trivia questions about Spongebob characters. And uh, it had files that are nicely formatted for this sort of thing. Except uh, they were encoded using this one weird scheme that I guess was supposed to make it harder for people to decode and harder for people to change. <clears throat> Which, uh, most of these imports, all of the ones that I have selected, are basically just to deal with that. To deal with uh, decoding the data. <laughs> Now, instead of a scanner to go through the file, I used a data input stream. And it's like a scanner, except it expects uh, data instead of just text. Text is data. Anyways. <laughs> so, trivia game. Uh, we have to make a question class, and we have to alternate players and answer stuff. So these are... Uh, what I use as relative paths for each of my trivia files. Now these are the raw files that Battle for Bikini Bottom uses. I have not uh, changed them in any way. 
And uh, these are all stored alongside my project folder so that these are, I, I can simply use these as paths, as relative paths. And these are the topics that each of these trivia files are on. I ask for a trivia topic, validate it, and then once I do that, I get a path object, which is what I need to work with a data input stream, and then I load each of the lines of the file into a string array called file lines, and I also catch exceptions. <clears throat> And uh, really quickly, I'm not going to explain uh, every line of code here, but this is uh, the thing that loads the lines, and now they're encoded in uh, a certain format which is uh, given here. I have a byte array, these streams, and this is uh, how I have to read a short now a short is a 16-bit signed twos complement integer, and uh, I have to read one at the start for the number of lines. And the only difficulty is that uh, the data input stream works in uh, big endian byte order. These are encoded in little endian byte order, so I have to reverse these two bytes, and I found this uh, snippet to do that to work with Little Indian instead. And then for each of those lines, I uh, read one short for their length. Then I read the contents. I uh, deobfuscate them. This is a binary XOR, <laughs> which is, uh, I find it really interesting, but I'm not gonna explain it. And uh, I have to convert those bytes into a string using uh, the character set CP1252, which is a Windows code page 1252, and it's, uh, I ended up having to use this instead of any other one because this is, uh, this has a special encoding format for apostrophes, the little fancy ones that, uh, Microsoft Word, say, will insert, you know, once, uh, you do an apostrophe in Microsoft Word. And then once I'm done reading it, I close the data stream, and then I return the result. So where was I? Oh yeah. And uh, from this uh, list of lines, now they're in the format question, answer, 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 correct answer. And so I uh, loop through all of those, getting the current question, each of the answers, and uh, the correct answer is in the form of a char from A to D, which, again, chars are integers in disguise, so I uh, do that to get the right uh, number value. Then I add that as a question using my question constructor, which, by the way, I should have went over that first. It's a uh, question is a very simple class with a constructor and a few getters. Apologies that I didn't implement a setter, but I didn't feel it to be necessary this time. And of course, catching exceptions. And, uh, so the challenge is that you are supposed to give five questions each to two players. These, uh, these trivia files have more than five questions each, so what I do... Well, more than 10 questions each, excuse me. So uh, I decided to shuffle the list using a Fisher Yates shuffle before taking the first 10 and putting them into an array of arrays of questions. And now we play the trivia game uh, for each. We have uh, an integer array with player points and then we fill them with zero, even though we don't technically have to. If we uh, got rid of this, then it would play just fine. But anyways, uh, we loop through each player, and uh, we print out whose turn it is, and then for each question that the player gets, 
we print out that question, we print out all the answers. I use my input choice char function. Uh, it's a very good and trusty function that I coded uh, in my testing suite. And I import it here to you know, give a choice between A, B, C, and D. And if we got the answer right, we add one to our score. Otherwise, we don't. And then once uh, the players are done playing the game, we have to figure out who got the highest score. So I go through and uh, not only do I calculate the maximum score, I also uh, have an array, or not an array, an array list of integers called best, which holds every single player that has that score, that maximum score. And if only one player has the maximum score, then that player wins. Otherwise, and I go over how uh, this happens in my Rock, Paper, Scissors game, which was assignment four. But I print out it's a tie between players, say, two, three, and seven. And uh, this is all separated by commas and stuff. And there's also the word and. Now this doesn't matter uh, for two player game. But uh, for more players, which you can totally do with this uh, same code if you just change one constant. Then uh, this will work and it'll do the commas and the and right. I suppose, I suppose the and matters if there's a tie between the only two players. But anyways... Uh, let's run us through a game of this, shall we? So, trivia topics. Uh, Patrick, Squidward, Sandy, Mr. Krabs, and Gary. Those are different Spongebob characters. This time I will choose Mr. Krabs. Player one's turn. What is the name of Mr. Krabs' pet sea worm? Wormy, Little Guy, Mr. Doodles, or Me Money? Now, this was only mentioned in one episode, uh, as far as I know. It's the one where they make a commercial for the Krusty Krab, I believe. And he calls him Mr. Doodles. And here we are. It says correct. What is Mr. Krab's favorite thing in the whole world? Skydiving, parasailing, plankton, or money? Hmm, money. <laughs> what does Mr. Krabs do for a living? Sells balloons? Owns the Krusty Krab, collects garbage, or pinches pennies. Now I'm going to intentionally get this one wrong and say pinches pennies. The real answer is uh, owns the Krusty Krab. What color are Mr. Krab's pants? Blue. What was the Krusty Krab originally? This was uh, mentioned in Krusty Krab training video where uh, it's a converted retirement home. Although in another episode, it also mentions that the Krusty Krab was the name of a pirate ship that he grew up on. And uh, he was a pirate with his grandpappy. <laughs> and that, that was like the focus of a, a whole episode is that his grandpappy has come back and still thinks that the Krusty Krab is a pirate ship. And they have to convince him that it is. <laughs> it's a fun episode. But anyways, now it's player, two t uh, player two's turn. Player 1 got 4 points out of 5, so let's make sure Player 2 wins by getting 5 out of 5. What does Mr. Krabs live in? An old shoe, an anchor, a hole in the ground, or a state of disarray? He lives in an anchor. Has con been converted into a building. How much does a Krabby Patty cost? On Wednesdays. The answer is uh, 99 cents, though usually it's 2 dollars That was mentioned, uh in an episode called Imitation Crabs, and that was a Spongebob giving the real Mr. Krabs and an imitation Mr. Krabs, who was a robot, a trick question that uh, only the real Mr. Krabs could answer, but the real Mr. Krabs got all of them wrong, because they're trick questions. How many bumps are on Mr. Krabs' back? 21, 50, 14, it's hard to tell through all that hair, or three. Three. Correct. What is not on a Krabby Patty? 
ketchup, onions, lettuce, or special sauce. Special sauce. What is written on the dumpster behind the Krusty Krab? <laughs> Nematodes are people too. Patchy was here. Squidward smells. Or all of the above. All of the above. This was uh, Sailor Mouth, where it was mentioned. And so player one, as we expected, got four points. Player two got five. Player two got more, so player two wins. Yay! So, anyways, that was the entire assignment. And uh, I hope you had as much fun listening to it as I did making it. Take care.